of people don't see fat phobia as b bigotry. They see um, their attitudes, their disparaging attitudes towards fat people as a manifestation of health concerns. And it's through the language of health that attitudes towards gender, race, color, ability are obscured. There's a lot of ways in which um, thinness and fitness become a stand-in for whiteness and masculinity and he like heterosexuality. Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, hello. If you are returning, welcome back. Thank you so much for sticking around. I really appreciate you. If you did not see my last video, I'm currently filming in what is going to be my office. <laughs> uh, we very much just have like the bare minimum set up right now and this is gonna get a lot cozier and homier as the weeks go on. For right now, this is just what you get. And also, uh, if you can hear like some kind of white noise in the back, uh, we have our central air on because it's like 90 degrees in Denver today. I am back and it feels good to be back. I missed making content for you guys. And today I'm coming at you with another history lesson style video. And we're focusing on none other than Virgie Tovar. And if you don't know who Virgie Tovar is, um, she's kind of like what I would consider to be one of like the OG fat acceptance people on social media. And I'm of the opinion that she's like a prime example of how some of these fat activists like really, really commodify fat acceptance and capitalize off of it and ultimately capitalize off of people's insecurities, which I think is an odd thing. Like I think self-help in general is a very odd industry. And I honestly think that fat acceptance could be considered like a branch off of uh, the self-help industry. Before we get into today's video, I want to thank today's sponsor of the video, Care Of. Care Of is a supplement subscription service that makes it easy to stick to a consistent routine. After taking the quiz to find out exactly what you need, Care Of sends you your personalized 30-day supply of vitamins. And when I say this is personalized, I mean it is personalized down to the individual packets that each day of vitamins comes in, has your name on it, and a cute little quote on it for that day. The vitamins that I get from care of consist of <laughs> uh, the rhodiola vitamin which i'm sure i'm butchering how to pronounce that name um, but basically it helps uh to feel less low energy in the afternoon which is definitely something i struggle with i also take the cranberry supplement uh to help my overall urinary tract health which as a cisgender lady is something i care very much about and i like as on top of as possible and i also take magnesium which helps support good sleep healthy bones and your overall Overall fitness goals. Magnesium can help with your occasional sleepless nights, your muscle function, and is an essential mineral for over 300 reactions in your body. I've really been able to feel the magnesium's effects more than anything um, as I find myself having an increased amount of energy throughout the day, meaning that I think it's helping me get deeper sleep, which is like invaluable to me. <laughs> and I've also found that I it just helps me feel more relaxed and uh, just, more, yeah, like less like Ooh, about everything which is really nice and something that I also desperately need. Top of the daily vitamin packs that they sent me, they also sent over their uh, sleep supplement, um, which I went from taking magnesium glyconate to this. It helps naturally lull me to sleep and uh, I don't feel drowsy the next day, which is big for me when it comes to like sleepy time help and all of that kind of stuff. Um, I really enjoyed this. It's completely gone. And so yeah, I really enjoyed this. They also have like protein powders and stuff and they sent me their whey chocolate protein powder and I am a member of like the Ninja Creamy Club and I will be adding this to my uh, protein ice creams because the Ninja Creamy is amazing. So yeah. <laughs> Forming a vitamin routine has always been really hard for me. I always forget to take them like, and it's a big part of post-op like weight loss surgery stuff. And just the whole setup of Care Of has helped me remember to do that a lot better uh, with the individual packs. And then also you get them delivered right to your door, which is awesome. Uh, the individual packs have come in big, big handy for me 
when me and Avery have been moving because I didn't have to keep track of a million different bottles of vitamins. I just had those ones right here. Support the habit forming. Um, Care of has a free app that you can use that will send you daily alerts to take your vitamins. It'll also help you track your progress and you can earn rewards just for consistency. So if you wanna try Care of, use the link in my bio to go take your quiz and find out what your personalized needs are. And you can use my code Megan Ann, that's M-E-G-A-N-A-N-N-E at checkout for 50% off your first order. So thank you so much to Care of for sponsoring today's video. And thank you to you guys for continuing to interact with my content that brands like Care of want to keep working with me. So, well, first off, that since we're on like shilling time of the video, I wanna show off these earrings. I wore like the normal rainbow pride earrings in my last video and I also got them in uh the pan pride flag colors because I am pansexual and uh these are from a Etsy store called Danielle Alley Designs and I found them just through like a random TikTok like the TikTok hadn't even gone viral but it just showed up on my for you page and they were so cute and I also loved how uh inclusive they were with their line of flags like they included like every flag possible and yeah so I want to give them a shout out the link to these all will be down below they're super great quality and they arrived really fast and yeah so i love these these are little trans pride flags so yeah happy pride hey so good news uh, i actually reached out to daniel alley designs and they were kind enough to give my audience a coupon code uh, i don't earn any money off of this they were just really nice and wanted to give my audience something um and yeah so the coupon code is hey look 15 for 15% 15 off your purchase until July 13th. So thank you to them for giving you guys this. And I hope you go use it because I really, really love these earrings. All right, bye. Now that I have all of that out of the way, let's get into the main topic of this video, which is Virgie Tovar. Who is Virgie Tovar? According to her website, Virgie Tovar is an author, lecturer, and leading expert in weight-based discrimination and body positivity. She holds a master's degree in sexuality studies with a focus on intersections of body size, race, and gender. She has been featured in a lot of magazines and news publications, and her most notable publication is You Have the Right to Remain Fat, which is about her experiences growing up as a fat girl. The publisher's summary for You Have the Right to Remain Fat is as follows. I'm just going to read it. Growing up as a fat girl, Virgie Tovar believed that her body was something to be fixed. But after two decades of dieting and constant guilt, she was over it and gave herself the freedom to just trust her own body again. Ever since, she's been helping others do the same. Tovar is hungry for a world where bodies are valued equally, food is free from moral judgment, and you can jiggle through life with respect. In concise and candid language, she delves into unlearning fat phobia, dismantling sexist notions of fashion, and how to reject diet culture's greatest lie, that fat people need to wait before beginning their best lives. She also offers like uh, courses, talks, and trips on her website, uh, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. I really think Virgie came on the scene like at least on the internet uh, with her video no I won't cut you a smaller piece of cake or no I won't cut you a smaller slice of cake sorry and in this video which I met I think is like meant to be pretty much satire um, but the premise of it for me at least is like just too ridiculous to like laugh at um, because I'm just like wow <laughs> But in this video, Virgie talks about CRFIs or cake related fat phobic incidents where she explains that a CRFI is like any incident involving cake in a public setting, mainly like office settings is the one that's used in this, where if so, where it's like fat phobic if someone asks for a smaller piece of cake, no matter what the reasoning is. A cake related fat phobic incident or CRFI is that moment when it's time to eat delicious cake and it's interrupted by a moralizing impulse. Inevitably, there's always someone at the party who has to declare publicly that their slice is too large and that the person who's cutting the cake, almost invariably a woman, must do some disproportionate amount of labor in order to accommodate their need to feel superior. In this video, she makes a whole bunch of weird points like trying to tie this to uh, feminism and like patriot the patriarchy and like 
to me, these are all just like false talking points and used to get more people on her side as a lot of people in fat acceptance do, which I think ultimately diminish what fe feminism is actually like trying to accomplish. CRFIs have a history of creating a hierarchy among women and ultimately in maintaining misogynist expectations. Don't make other people be your cake nanny because women already have too much on their plate with a sexist culture navigating underwhelming romantic options and an absurdly inexplicable pay gap. So remember, the next time that you're on the verge of committing a CRFI, be an ally to women rather than an accomplice to patriarchy. Because after all, patriarchy doesn't give a fuck about you, girl. Um, but I've already made a whole video on like reacting to the CRFI video and I'll have it like linked here and in the description down below if you want to go check that out. It's from I think last year or the year before. I don't know. It's old, but it's there. So before I like get super into Virgie and like who she is, what she's done, all that kind of stuff. I just need it out here that I don't think Virgie is like anywhere near as bad as like other people I've covered in history lessons like uh, Tess Holliday and Sonali Rashatwar. I really don't think that she's spreading as harmful of narratives. Like I said, the reason I wanna talk about Virgie is because I think she is really uh, one of the prime examples to show how the figures in fat acceptance uh, capitalize so heavily off of people's insecurities. And I know we could absolutely say that about like the diet and fitness industries as well. Um, but for some reason with like the bright and bubbly and wholesome appearing marketing that Virgie operates with, for me, it's like more like covert and secretive. And uh, then we know of like the diet and fitness industry. And we'll cover this later, but she also brings in the topics of like race and feminism and specifically spiritual to appeal to more people. And I am very much of the belief that if someone feels that they can offer something to the public and like help them and they can also use it to like make money, then like, yeah, that's just part of the machine we're in, like go for it. I believe that so long as it's not harming other people or has the potential to harm other people. And I think using fat acceptance as a way to make money is really towing a very thin line between helping people people and harming people. I really don't think it's intentional on her part, but like you know me and my thoughts on fat acceptance and body positivity and that I think what it has turned into has the potential to harm people who follow those ideologies as someone who's been there. I think she's capitalizing off of these narratives and it really has, like I said, the potential to harm people. And we see this kind of thing all the time with online content creators now, like it's definitely not unique to Virgie, um, where they They'll be like writing certain messages and narratives and whatever about specifically like self-help and loving yourself and whatever and outwardly it comes like or on face value it comes off as like very genuine and like they really want to just help you and like they're just on their TikTok or whatever talking about stuff but then you go to the link in their bio and they're like buy my course on self-acceptance and body love and whatever when they really don't have any kind of qualifications to be teaching people how to do that other than the fact that they maybe paid like $150 to get a certificate online saying that they could be like a life coach. It's not unique to Virgie, but since I talk a lot about fat acceptance and creators within fat acceptance here, that's why I'm talking about her in this, in this instance. So like I mentioned, I feel like seeing content creators offering help and courses to coach people online when they really don't have qualifications to do so uh, is so common. Like it's so common. But one thing about Virgie is that she uses her education a lot to make herself seem more reputable in what she's talking about. And so I, when I was researching more of what she said and all that kind of stuff, I started thinking more about her education and I wanted to look into it. 
um, because I think it's a big part of her brand and I think it's something that we can't really ignore. I will say that Virgie, I will give her some credit in that she does have degrees saying that she kind of knows how to talk about what she's talking about. Um, whereas like, I feel like a lot of fat acceptance people just like talk out of their ass most of the time and that's pretty much it. So I will give her credit where credit is due and that she is an educated woman and uses her education to spread things that she's passionate about. And like, I'm an educated lady as well. And so I can give credit where credit is due. And I am also someone who speaks on something in like a public forum and I do make money off of it like Virgie does. Uh, but I have never and literally will never sell courses on anything. And I will also surely never market myself the leading expert in anything like Virgie does. I'm just a girl who got bored during quarantine and I just started talking to, my, talking to myself on camera about life experiences and whatever and it morphed into where we are right now. <laughs> Virgie on the other hand does sell those things like courses and books and whatever and she does market herself as the leading expert. Not a leading expert, the leading expert in weight-based discrimination. So in that case, I'm of the opinion that like some extended education or whatever is necessary to be able to talk on those things and like brand yourself in such a like a high prestigious title, right? Upon doing some digging, according to LinkedIn, Virgie graduated in 2005 uh, from the University of California, Berkeley with a bachelor's degree in political science. And then she graduated from San Francisco State University with a master's degree in human sexuality. Do you believe that is now called sexuality studies at San Francisco State, so that's what I'm gonna be calling it. And I obviously don't know like what exact courses Virgie took, and I'm sure it has changed since 2005 because like curriculums are constantly being added and subtract, added to and subtracted from. And so I'm sure it's changed, but I went online and just saw what the curriculums were for each of those things to see if anything was like, relating to weight-based discrimination and in society and that kind of stuff and to see if she really is as trained in this topic other than with her life experiences since that's what she uses to brand herself and market herself so often. The political science undergrad at UC Berkeley, um, judging by some brief research that I did, it doesn't appear that anything relating to weight-based social politics is required in the curriculum. There is a requirement to take one history class from like a pre-approved list. And of the course, of the ones listed under the US category, uh, it looks like they could cover something based off of like weight-based discrimination. But after reading the course descriptions, it looks like they mainly focus uh, at looking through, looking at history through like racial, ethnicity, gender kind of lenses and not weight. And when I just Googled like UC Berkeley political science undergraduate degree requirements, uh, fat phobia, nothing came up uh, except for two talks with Virgie from 2019 and an event like, so it wasn't like a formal class, but it was just kind of like a sidebar, like talking event thing uh, for students to go to where the focus was on like fat phobia today. And that was all I could find. When it came to the masters in human sexuality, um, San Francisco State University was not as generous uh, with their course descriptions as the course descriptions at UC Berkeley <laughs> as to what is required to get a sexuality, stud sexuality studies masters today. But from reading about them, it does seem like they just mainly focus on human sexuality as it pertains to like orientation, gender identity, psychology, um, childhood, pubescence, that kind of stuff. Um, and when I Googled SFSU, Master of Arts in Sexuality Studies, Master's Degree in Fat Phobia, uh, nothing came up relating to fat phobia as a course or whatever, uh, except something from the creative writing department and a thesis from a student in 2017. So now like anybody can come at me with like, Megan, this is a stretch. And like, I will totally understand because as someone, like I said, who went to college and graduated college, I think one thing we can agree on is that like a college education can really help you think more critically about a lot of different things. 
um, especially things like majoring in political science, uh, as you study, as a lot of what you study, from my understanding, is the intersectionality of a lot of different groups throughout history, right? But if you should know one thing about me, <laughs> it's that I stand very strong in my belief that the comparisons that activists like Virgie, which we'll talk about later, draw between fat phobia, like misogyny, racism, anti-Semitism, homophobia, and transphobia, and like ableism are all false equivalencies in that I do not think fat phobia even holds a candle to any of those other things that I just listed. I made a whole video on that like a couple months ago. It was a real banger. It did really well. It was very good. I really think Virgie like uses her education to try and make these comparisons seem more valid, um, but I really don't think they're the same at all. And I think it's kind of silly because it doesn't really appear that Virgie took any courses in college um, that touched on these topics because she uses it as such a big market part of her marketing. It's like mentioned a million times on her website. Um, and yes, like I said, the curriculum absolutely could have changed since 2005. And this is just me speculating here, but it is really, really hard for me to believe that anything regarding fat phobia and weight-based discrimination would have been removed from a 2005 curriculum in college uh, because the topic of fat phobia and weight-based discrimination has only become super popular and like widely discussed in the last like 10 years or so and so that's just my opinion but yeah, so do with this information about her education as like as you please. And if you have more insight as to what these curriculums like include, uh, please let me know in the comments because I'm curious and I only went with what I could find. Before we start talking about some of Virgie's offerings, books, that kind of stuff, things that she sells, things that she uses to make money, uh, I think it's important to go over what some of her like core beliefs are and to really see some of the um, false equivalencies, in my opinion, that I think she draws and uh, some of the buzzwords that she uses to relate to people. I started with her Instagram and while a lot of the more like statement-y kind of posts are from a few years ago, I think it's been proven in more recent interviews Views and posts and art and newsletters and stuff that she still very much believes these things and so yeah and she also hasn't come out and like spoken out against them at all either so we're gonna start with this one and it says I can either be thin and have everything or fat and have nothing and it has that crossed out as if like no that's not true and then underneath it says, I can either accept my body size or destroy my mental and possibly physical health attempting to control it insinuating that like losing weight or going on a diet will automatically destroy and possibly your mental and possibly physical health um which is just not true it can be true if you don't go about it in the quote-unquote correct way i think anybody should look into the more the most uh like realistic way for them to go about weight loss and you'll be fine and yeah so and then there's this one that says no one fat or thin will live forever which i think is just a super pessimistic way to look at your health and your life i've lost like i had weight loss surgery five years ago and i lost like 100 pounds and i can tell you that my quality of life has changed has increased significantly since I was like 315 pounds. Yeah, I used to think this too, like nobody lives forever, who cares? Why put in this work? But like my quality of life and the things that I can do uh, have all vastly like increased. And so I think this is a super just pessimistic way to look at your life. There's this one that says anti-diet equals anti-racist, uh, which again is comparing um, like fat phobia and diet culture to racism which I really just will never ever believe that that is a remotely accurate comparison to make. <laughs> uh, this one says fat phobia isn't just the fear of fat bodies, it's the terror of marginalized people of all sizes refusing to be small emotionally, spiritually, and politically. When we take up space, when we express big emotions, when we demand visibility, when we demand justice, we are large. And I think comparing that phobia to the terror of marginalized people is 
interesting and also not true. And again, is something that I am very passionate about um, because I am like a member of a marginalized group and that I am a part of the LGBTQ plus community. And so is my partner. And uh, it's genuinely scary to exist right now, given the state of some of the things that are happening in the country. And that is more terror than I have ever felt and that I ever did feel being a super, super morbidly obese person. I'm still not thin, but I'm a lot smaller than I used to be. And I, when I was at my heaviest, I never felt a uh, terror. So yeah, but that's just my opinion. Let me know if you feel anything different below. This one says, next time someone asks you if you should be eating that, ask them what they have done to dismantle white supremacist heteropatriarchy lately. Cause that's what's hurting people, not cookies. Two things can be true at the same time. Also using these buzzwords to try and further your point is weird. Um, when white supremacy, in my, in, in my opinion, white supremacy and the patriarchy and heteronormative uh, whatevers um, really have nothing to do with fat phobia. One says, dieting is not a sign of success, it's a sign of woundedness. And we're gonna touch on this bit in like a couple minutes um, because she does really have very strong opinions about dieting and she compares them to some very, very strong ideas. So yeah, I just wanted to put this one up there to get that in our noodles. Anyway, a lot of these sentiments can be heard coming from her own mouth in more recent uh, things that she's been involved in, such as her interview with Ulta like eight months ago, um, where she very much still believes that fat phobia is on the same level as racism, homophobia, misogyny, anti-Semitism, and ableism. She compares being fat to being disabled. So here are clips from that. Parenthetically say that our notion of health is deeply flawed, problematic, and kind of living in the 1800s. Like the BMI was invented in the 1800s, okay? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. by, like, Euro by European men. But yeah, yes. by like this Belgian mathematician. He wasn't even a physician. And he ended up becoming the grandfather of eugenics. <laughs> so like just to contextualize how we're defining health, it's by a Belgian mathematician from 1830. Right who is the grandfather of eugenics. So, yeah. end parentheses. <laughs> so like, you know, right? Like, in fact, fat phobia is an actual legitimate form of discrimination. It aligns with other types of discrimination, like around race or gender or, or you know, or any number of marginalized identities um, in the sense that, you know, it's largely a belief system that isn't really based in evidence or data or science, but that is socially condoned and creates an idea of some people are better than others, right? right? And so fat phobia manifests in a lot of different ways, like everything from a wage gap, like plus size women make 9,000 to 19, thousand dollars less per year than straight sized women there's also well-documented medical discrimination and things like you know things we all know like how higher weight people are considered less appealing partners less appealing dates so there's all these different obviously fashion like there's all different ways that fat phobia manifests um and it's legal in 48 out of 50 states so just to be clear like you can be overtly fired for your weight and get in absolutely no trouble in 48 out of 50 states so that's that i mean might still believe that a fat person is secretly a thin person <laughs> and I'm, I'm really here to like dismantle so I see like the culture is like, oh, solution to fat phobia, just try and force and bully every fat person to become a thin person. And fat activism says, no, you do not blame the individual who's experiencing discrimination for the discrimination, you end the discrimination. Yeah. You see the intersection, really, what is your definition of health? Mm, yeah, that's really complicated, right? I, I think I wanna sort of, I wanna talk about that question, but I wanna start by saying that, you know, no one has to be healthy. Tea. No, right? Like, Tea. I mean, it's like, no, like there is no governing body that's like out there putting, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like, no one owes anybody that in, in either the traditional sense of the word or any other more innovative or, you know, more politicized maybe even version of that word. So I think it's important to say like, and, and I, I wanna back up and bring in intersectionality and say like, right, like look at the disabled community, mm. right? Um, Like I think people with disabilities have and activists within that space have consistently been saying like I'm never going to be your notion of healthy that doesn't mean I don't get to be a full human you get to treat me some kind of way right and so I think that I love taking that principle within disability rights to fat activism and to understandings of fatness so I want to start there right like no matter what size you are you don't owe anybody else your health but I mean for me right like in an ideal world where 
Like, in an ideal world, there wouldn't be health-based gatekeeping at all. But let's take a step back and say, okay, like, I want to redefine the notion of health. In my mind, this it's a very expansive notion that takes into account spiritual health, that takes into account, do you have community? Do you feel like, I mean, like, one of the things that fat phobia does, just like a lot of other marginal, marginalized, you know, like, phobias and, like, different kinds of discrimination, is it creates a sense that you don't belong in your own society. That is essentially, like, I, I use the metaphor of the family. Like, when you're in a marginalized body or have a marginalized identity, it's it's kind of like when your parents sort of kick you out of their house. Mm -hmm. So for me, right, like I, I always go back to notions of like what what, what we know that humans need um, is th they are connection, acceptance, love, comfort, affirmation, right? We know this is what we give to mm. children. That's what every human being needs. And so anything that isn't in that wheelhouse isn't isn't promoting health in my mind. And I, I want to bring in like um, – actually like a friend who's who's a PhD in nutrition and she she brought up this incredible question to me and she was like if science isn't serving humanitarian ends then what is the point that we're doing like what's the point of it you know and it's like right because are, are we making science for aliens for like some I mean like what are we you know what I'm saying it's like so if, if if by our scientific notion of whatever health is right now if that's excluding 68 percent of the population which is like the plus size population if that's excluding 70-ish percent of the U.S. population, then it's not working. It's not. And honestly, I could make a whole video like reacting or like providing commentary on that interview alone because yowza, there are some very harsh, fal harsh false equivalencies made in that video. <laughs> And uh, I was like cringing the entire time I was watching it. And I was watching it on like 1.5 speeds. And still, I was like, whoa, that was just said so there's that. Let me know if you want that below in the comments. In a recent newsletter she wrote called Dieting Equals Quote I'm Triggered, she compares fat phobia to violence and refers to wanting to start a diet as meaning someone is triggered and that fat phobia experienced as a young person can cause trauma later on in life. And sidebar again, uh, this is something that I can like cosine i do think that a lot of the harmful things that were said to me not even harmful just things said to me about my body um or my weight growing up really did like influence a lot of my behaviors and my thoughts about myself uh in adulthood that i'm still working through in therapy um but that being said like some of my very very best friends grew up very thin and like unable to put on weight and they experience the same kind of stuff now, even as far as I know, when we're all like 26, 27 years old. And so to say that that's only like a fat person thing, it feels very disingenuous to me. I think growing up as a kid, having anybody make comments about your weight feels very weird and icky. And you don't really realize like until you're older, how much it actually did affect you because you're like, oh, I would never say that to somebody, let alone a child. I think just saying that's a fat person thing is like taking, is just making big, big assumptions um, because I think everybody kind of goes through that. So in this article, she states, Fat phobia, I strongly feel, is similar to racism, homophobia, ableism, etc. In that they're all introduced in childhood. And yes, you do learn to feel deeply terrified of the repercussions of being part of or even associated with the out group. In a child's malleable mind, the threat of being part of the outgroup lands as a threat of excommunication, which is tantamount to loss of approval and love, which is tantamount to a life to a type of emotional slash spiritual death, which a child can't differentiate from actual death. If you, like me, were a child with emotionally unavailable or abusive parents, meaning you're a child who instinctively and subconsciously turns outside their family to seek love and approval, your fear of excommunication from your parents may be heightened. And so to even use the sentiment of racism and homophobia and ableism next to or and comparing it to fat phobia in that when you're a child you're afraid of these things because you're afraid of being part of like the out group and being excommunicated is absolutely like ludicrous to me and that's because like I talked about this in my coming out video and somebody put it up perfectly in that I was talking about when I was coming out that I knew my family life more or less was gonna be fine because like my parents didn't care. They just wanted me to be happy. I found out my dad knew since I was like 12, he just had a feeling and he was right. But 
for me, giving up that like lack of normalcy, somebody put it perfectly and that no matter what your living situation is, what your family situation is, when you come out as some form of the LGBTQ plus community, you are giving up a certain level of normalcy. And that's something that's really scary. Whereas I think especially today, uh, being fat, like being overweight is like more normal than it ever has been before. Uh, it's statistically proven that it is actually. And, um, I think that even comparing that to being part of the out group that is being queer right now, especially right now, uh, is, is like I said, absolutely ludicrous, let alone comparing it to being a disabled person living in a society that literally is not kind to you at all in any way, shape or form, um, or being a person of color because also living in a society in a country that is not kind to you in any way, shape or form is not the same as being fat right now. It's just not. And this was recent. I think this was written like this month. This is just an absolutely bonkers fucking comparison to make, but that's just my opinion. Anyways, it goes on saying food restriction. And this is just an excerpt from this newsletter, by the way, that I took. Uh, it's longer than this, but uh, it says food restriction, dieting and quote, healthy living are introduced as ways to avoid or mitigate experiencing the violence. As we, uh, according to the literature on child psychology, a child who internalizes the blame for the violence they are experiencing will create a fantasy wherein they can stop the violence themselves. This fantasy is a narrative that isn't true, but that allows them to believe that they have some control. E uh, if I change my, for example, if I change my body, then people will like me versus I can't control how others choose to behave. I must live my life as well as I possibly can, which is something that once you come to terms with really does create a lot of freedom. Um, but in the case of, and that was a side note for me, sorry. In the case of fat phobia, diet culture provides that fantasy. Diet culture, the ubiquitous cultural messaging that, at, that asserts thin bodies are superior and that everyone can have a thin body through food restriction, neither of these are based in facts, by the way, steps in, uh, steps in once the violence slash trauma is introduced and offers a quote solution. The fantasy of weight loss becomes a way that someone can cope with the violence slash trauma through the belief that they can avoid or at least offset the violence of fat phobia by changing their body to fit cultural expectations. And uh, just like comparing fat phobia to being part of other like actually marginalized communities or like out groups as she put them, uh, comparing fat phobia and dieting to violence uh, and specifically to refer to dieting or weight loss as like some sort of trauma response, which is pretty much what she's inferring here. Similarly to Sonali is so wrong. <laughs> and this is where I really start to believe, uh, I mean, aside from a whole bunch of other things that like her narratives could genuinely harm people down the line. It's similar to how fat activists on like TikTok just blatantly call dieting or people who lose weight fat phobic. I think equating that something that someone can do for their health and their own, and on their own like using their own autonomy they can make their own decisions to do that for themselves um to things that are very much looked down upon in society like fat phobia like um violence <laughs> uh could potentially skew the views of people in their audience who like don't want to go who do want to go down the path of weight loss for whatever that reason might be and uh, point them in the direction of like not wanting to do that anymore in the interest of not being fat phobic or wanting to protect their mental health thinking that it that it's a trauma response or not wanting to perpetuate the violence like i think it's super dangerous and i think it spreads really harmful false messaging when i was on the fat acceptance side of the internet i and actively like taking in their messaging and whatever i think i subconsciously thought like oh well weight loss is fat phobic like and i don't hate fat people and i don't want to be mean to people and i don't want to make people feel bad about themselves so i should just stay this way and not harm others for the record i was 16. <laughs> but when push came to shove and i needed to lose weight for my own health at the ripe age of 20 years old uh, i started to realize how harmful the messaging was to me and as I got older, how it had skewed my views of weight loss, which is why I talk about it here now. I've never really made this connection in a video before, but it's something I've always thought about. And I don't really have like a formed thought on this whole concept that I'm about to talk about, but I just wanted to bring it up because Virgie talks about 
uh, feminism and fighting the patriarchy and stuff so often in her, in her content that it just feels relevant. Um, a lot of fat acceptance talking points revolve around protecting others' feelings. Like saying that like if you lose weight or like you post before and after photos if you've lost weight or whatever, it's harmful to your fat friends or your fat followers and it make and it'll make them feel bad about themselves, right? Even if it's something that you're really, really proud of doing because it's hard fucking work, okay? But a lot of fat activists talking points also have to do with fe feminism and that like the ideal beauty standard is inherently rooted in the patriarchy and all that kind of stuff, which I can like agree with for the most part. I think it's really interesting because it's also been stereotypically like a feminine trait to be a people pleaser and a caregiver and oftentimes put others feelings above your own for the other people's comfort. And at least in my family, that's how it was and still is. And it has taken and it still is taking a lot of therapy to like unlearn that. Like that's a really harmful thing to think. I don't, like I said, I don't have a fully formed thought on this. In my opinion, on like a surface level, it feels like inherently anti-feminist to push the narrative that someone, uh, like primarily women as well, because that's the prime audience in the fat acceptance community, should not do something for the betterment of their lives or to make themselves happier within their own person. Um, in order to protect the feelings of other people around them. And I don't know if that makes any sense and maybe it's a thought that I can make a video on at a later date, but it's just something that I've noodled on for a really long time and now felt like the video to kind of introduce it because Virgie talks about feminism, fighting the patriarchy, all that kind of stuff so often in her content. Anyways, that's like a brief overview of what Virgie has and continues to talk about on her platforms and other media, that kind of stuff. So it's very obvious, in my opinion, that Virgie uses a lot of actually marginalized communities and buzzwords to try and make her point seem more valid about fat phobia and to reel more people in and to relate to more people to ultimately get her get them on her side and buy her product after reading the homepage on her website um and all about all of virgie's qualifications that supposedly deem her the leading expert in weight-based discrimination you can then browse her self-help related products um, she offers four different books, uh, all of which like range around $17 plus tax and shipping if it's not a digital book. But then for me, where it really starts to get hinky is the courses. So she offers a 60 minute coffee talk with Virgie Tovar and this 60 minutes costs $150. I'm all about charging what you are worth as a graphic designer finding my freelance rate and continue and it's, it's hard uh so if that's what she feels she's worth then great um but again i really just don't think she has the qualifications other than lived experiences to do that and i think to charge that much for an hour of your time you need some sort of like piece of paper really and i know that's like shitty but i, I that's just how i feel i don't know um, and the description is, I'd like to invite you to coffee with me. I love helping people get to a deeper understanding of diet culture, patriarchy, feminism, intersectionality, and liberation. I love to offer the tools I've developed over the last decade for as a fat positive self-love advocate. If you want to dive deeper into any of the material in the courses I offer or my books, book a 60 minute session with me. We'll meet digitally face to face via Google Meet. Don't forget the coffee. So this honestly seems like it's meant to be kind of like in in conjunct used in conjunction with her books or her other courses. So spending more money. <laughs> the next one uh, is the body positive tarot workshop, uh, which she does with another person named Helen Shewolf Seng. I probably butchered that, and I'm so sorry. Uh, but this is $129. 
and it says that, that your bo that body positive tarot is a self-paced course created by Virgie Tovar and Helen Shewolf Sang, centering uh, tarot as a tool for recovering from diet culture and deepening your relationship to your body. In this course, we will use narratives within tarot as healing modalities towards restoring your intuition. An integral grift of gift of grift. <laughs> An integral gift of the human experience that is undercut by experiences of body shame and fat phobia. We will also provide resources for finding meaning and power through stories and archetypes, discovering your own magic, and creating community and art. Learn your body through the tarot. Learn the tarot through your body. This one, they, on the courses like these, they give you kind of an overview of like what each thing is or like what each course will be. And so this one, you start by choosing a tarot deck and learning about the course timeline. And then it lets you know what you'll need to get started. Uh, and then there's a course about what does tarot teach us about body positivity, and then meeting Virgie and Helen, uh, learning some tarot history and basics, and getting to know your deck, which those are all very important things when it comes to tarot reading in general, so that's understandable why they are in there. So intro to the minor arcana and uh, is the next one, and then you learn about wands, which are cards one through 10, uh, and what wands teach us about power, and then swords, cards 1 through 10, what swords teach us about disembodiment. Then you learn about pentacles, uh, which is cards 1 through 10, and you teach us, and it, then it goes to what pentacles teach us about body capitalism. And then cups, cards 1 through 10, and then you learn about what cups teach us about our relationship to food. So they're tying tarot into body positivity and anti-diet culture, which I think is interesting. Uh, the next um, course is, is anti-diet work as death work with Angela Alberto. It retails for $99. And it says, leaving diet culture is both joyful and devastating. In this course, we talk about both. Death midwife Angela Alberto or and author Virgie Tovar designed this course to help you explore the shadow side of anti-diet work. I will say that in therapy, death work and shadow work is very important. It sucks ass, but it's very important and very helpful in your healing. Um, so I can, again, kind of understand how they brought these two things together, but I think it is interesting, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, it says, when we do anti-diet work, we begin to close a door, death, and open another, rebirth. The current conversation surrounding anti-diet work and body positivity is focused on the latter. Though a new post-dieting life is absolutely magic, we can't ignore that we are grieving what we've decided to leave behind, even if that's only a dream or a fantasy. Mind you, they're talking about, like, weight loss here. So, I think that is harmful in itself referring to losing weight as a dream or a fantasy uh, because I do think weight loss is made to be this big scary hard thing which it is in practice but like in theory and if you have resources which I know is a, are a privilege to have as well it's not a dream or a fantasy like it's very much an achievable thing um, but then it goes on to say, no matter how toxic diet culture is, it has worked its way into our hopes and desires as much as anti and as much blah, blah, blah. then it goes on to say, no matter how toxic diet culture is, it has worked its way into our hopes and desires. As much as anti-diet work is a series of beautiful realizations and life changes, it is also a series of deaths. Like the death of the myth that through controlling food, you can control how long you live and the death of allegiance to white supremacist beauty standards. We see this class as an opening, a thoughtful and engaging exploration of themes and tools rather than the final word on this topic. We encourage you to bring curiosity, play, creativity, wonder, sadness, ecstasy, rage, confusion, resentment, and love as, as you begin this incredible work with us. And again, you can see what the courses will cover or what the individual courses will cover throughout this whole thing. And it goes over, like, the first thing goes over, like, what death work is um, from a death midwife's perspective. Um, and uh, it says some logistics and best practices before you start. Um, the joyful and devastating act of giving up diet culture. Uh, it tells you how to use the toolkit that they give you, some journal prompts, um, before, after, and self-care rituals. Um, and it, tool number three is rad sympathy cards and postcards we made just for you for this class. Then you use, then you learn how to do death meditation. Uh, you learn how to bake something called a grief cake. 
Um, tool number six is sacred body adornment. Uh, tool number seven is a grief playlist on Spotify. <laughs> tool number eight, they teach you breath work. Tool number nine is cord cutting is a cord cutting ritual for letting go of thin dreams. Uh, again, tool number 10 is a tarot spread suggestion. Tool 11 is our morning pages, which I'm assuming is like a journal. Uh, and tool number 12 is called grieving can take practice. Here's how to start. And then the last bit is a letter from Virgie and Angela. And then they each have their own uh, death autobiography. So that's that one. And then the next one that she does um, is called Babe Camp. And this one is $299. Or you can do it in two payments of $149.50. Um, and by the website, it says Babe Camp equips students with the foundational tools that completely transformed my relationship to my body through 17 readings, 13 assignments, four journal prompts, video postcards, audio snippets, quizzes, and a bonus 10 minute meditation. I hold your hand through finally breaking up with diet culture. When you sign up, you get immediate access to the course. Are you ready for babehood? And then it goes, I've spent the past 10 years working to dismantle diet culture and end weight stigma on a societal and individual level. I've learned that it is essential to treat diet culture as both an ideology that lives in the mind and as a form of trauma that lives in the body. Uh, most interventions I've seen fall into... During most interventions, I've seen fall into one of four traps. They only deal with the ideological side of deconstructing diet culture, attempting to treat body shame as only an ideology that needs to be changed. They only deal with the somatic side of diet culture, attempting to reclaim movement without a strong ideological foundation on, in why diet culture is toxic. They only deal with body image without dealing with the relationship to food. They only deal with the relationship to food without dealing with body image. And then it says, this course was designed to bridge the intellectual and the somatic, addressing both the relationship to food and the body. Also, um, I added a side note here, uh, saying that it looks like Babe Camp was also like an excursion of some, of some kind, like a few years ago. Um, where they made this video about vegetables like offing people and then they have to like fight the vegetables to fight the patriarchy. Anyways, I'll post a clip of that here. I saved it. And she also offers like experiences to so, like trips. Um, camp Thunder Thighs was like a very notable one, and it was basically like a camp, like a summer camp for like fat women. Uh, I couldn't find like how much this actually costs to attend um, because I don't know if they've done it again. Um, but I remember it being quite the talking point when it was happening. And I also remember seeing people talking about it on like YouTube and stuff. And it was like an obscene amount of money to attend. Um, but it says that Camp Thunder Thighs is about living the five principles I believe, Virgie believes, lead to deep, meaningful change in our relationship to our bodies. One, community. Two, a critical and intersectional sectional political education. Three, practicing tools for healing and resiliency. And four, a non-judgmental space to recuperate our relationship to food. And five, movement whose only purpose is pleasure for a weekend in a beautiful place so you can use these tools to heal yourself and change the trajectory of history, basically. <laughs> Virgie believes in the power of radical self-love, political education, community building, and jiggling before breakfast, uh, and that she also believes in the power of loving the body you're in right now, which yes, absolutely do that. Like I am a firm believer in that as well. Even if you want to lose weight, there's nothing wrong with loving your body currently and think that losing weight is a big act of self-love for people and should be done out of place of self-love and not self-hate, because if it's done out of self-hate, then you're not going to get anywhere 
in my opinion. Like piggybacking off of that idea that I think pretty much anybody could agree with, uh, she says that her other interests include smashing patriarchy, eating fancy desserts, and helping build a world where every single person, regardless of size or health status, lives free from discrimination and bigotry. This intensive is about supporting you, teaching you tools, building community with you, and eating a lot of marshmallows on the beach near many majestic redwood trees. Together, we will break up with diet culture in the mindset that, mindset that keeps us in restriction mode. And it says Camp Thunder Thighs is for people of all sizes who feel drawn to doing the work of radical self-acceptance and body justice in a fat positive environment. So again, really using like big, big buzzwords to try and relate to any customer that comes along, um, in my opinion, to just make more money um, and really, really profiting off of like people's insecurities and people's need for community community can be great like that's awesome i think community is really important and hanging out with like people like you is very important um but you shouldn't have to pay an absorbent amount of money to do so and if i remember correctly this was very expensive and i can't find the price and i tried finding the price and i could not i just couldn't so um, but I do recall it being very expensive. <laughs> the next more recent thing that she uh, offered was a trip to Italy um, with her. And it says, andiamo, <laughs> sorry if you're Italian. Uh, Let's walk and eat through gorgeous central Italy. Italy is the home of legendary cuisine, breathtaking architecture, timeless art pieces, wine tasting and vineyards, afternoon espressos, and sidewalk cafes. What the Italians call la dolce vita, vita or the sweet life is yours for the taking. It uh, talks about accessibility notes, um, saying that Italy had, has not had disability rights or fat justice movement that is comparable in size or impact to the ones in the United States. I can only imagine why. And that the streets are cobbled and whatever, so there might be some accessibility limitations, which I think is a fair thing to note on this. Um, and there are two optional walking tours and the trip includes one train ride from Rome to Florence. The average weight capacity for the hotel beds is 500 pounds. Sitting on Italian trains is modified bench style with movable armrests. And uh, she links to, she linked to a fat travelers review of Rome for people interested in this trip. Uh, the trip was seven days and it had 10 to 20 spots, double occupancy and four star hotels. Uh, six breakfasts, two lunches, and three dinners included, which over the course of seven days does not seem like a lot for dinner, especially, uh, and lunch. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that was included, like our tours, pasta making class, Vatican City and Sistine Chapel tour, uh, St. Peter Basilica, train from Rome to Florence, walking, Florence walking tour, Tuscan farm tour, and train from Florence to Rome. Uh, and it included the hotel, the local guide, all city transfers, arrival at like airport transfer. Um, and it also, like I said, included six breakfasts, two lunches and three dinners. But on top of this, uh, you could opt in to a wine tasting with an Italian sommelier and, uh, but you still had to pay for your flights, um, all of the extra food and alcohol, uh, your visas and travel insurance and your airport transfers outside of the designated times that she gave you on the website. And so literally this is just a trip to Italy with Virgie Tovar and it doesn't really seem like there's any kind of time mapped out um to discuss the things that like she is super passionate about it literally just seems like you're going to Italy with Virgie Tovar and this costs outside of all the travel fees mind you which traveling internationally is expensive. $2,200, 2,199 US dollars. And 25% of that was due at the time. And I believe uh, was non-refundable after your spot was confirmed. So um, yeah. <laughs> so you're basically paying for a trip to Italy and then paying for a trip to Italy again, just to visit it with Virgie Tovar. Um, and again, in her about section on this travel website, on the trip website, it says, 
that uh, Virgie Tovar is the author of You Have the Right to Remain Fat, uh, The Self-Love Revolution, and Radical Body, po Body Positivity for Girls of Color. Um, she, is a she is a contributor for Forbes.com where she covers the plus size market and how to end uh, weight discrimination at work. Uh, her podcast they talk about talks about how she's been named one of the 50 most influential influential feminists by bitch magazine and has received yale's pointer fellowship in journalism she's been featured by the new york times blah blah blah, blah. nothing about her about her education on here so that's interesting but yeah i just thought this whole concept was interesting i have seen other creators do things like this and so i wasn't totally like Ew, but it's just like i don't i just think it's interesting in the context of the stuff that she also spews on her website about herself uh so yeah because i think it's it's logical to think that people would think like oh i go on this trip with this person it's gonna be really healing like we're gonna talk about all the discrimination i face like all my body Im all my body image issues diet culture all that kind of stuff but really it just seems like it's a trip to italy for virgie that virgie's making money off of so there's that other odds and ends like she also covers or she also offers corporate trainings to help businesses quote create a non-judgmental environment where professionals can build awareness vocabulary and best practices aimed at decreasing optimized or at decreasing optimized weight by based discrimination uh, it says she combines her academic background, professional expertise, and personal lived experience to design virtual and in-person experiences that open up curiosity, empathy, and empowerment. It says former clients have included Seattle Transit Agency, UC Berkeley, Everybody Gym, and Affinity Spaces with Square and Waymo. Uh, I couldn't find pricing on this as you have to inquire within using an email address that is provided on the website. My thoughts on all of these offerings, right, are that it's painfully obvious that for lack of a better term fat activism has become kind of a cash cow for virgie i think all self-help is questionable in terms of how profitable of an industry that it is because i think selling products essentially to help people's mental health when virgie in this context has zero qualifications to do so is incredibly dangerous virgie even follows the stereotypical self-help route of bringing spirituality into it with like the body positivity tarot and the death work courses and i'm not sure how to explain this or if it's even like the right term to use but using tarot and like death work in the same realm as something like body positivity and anti-diet culture like feels very appropriation-y to me. I don't know if that's the right word, but I'm just going to keep going with it. Um, I believe that anybody should be able to practice whatever they need to to heal uh, as long as it's not harming themselves or other people. But bringing things like the the bringing things like that that are so deeply rooted in spirituality into the anti-diet and body positivity conversation seems predatory and almost on the same level as like uh, a lot of the more popular self-help gurus that have been around for forever that bring uh, like Christianity into the conversation in order to hook more people in. It seems very similar to that. Um, and I could honestly do a whole video on like the weirdness of the self-help industry if you want me to. Uh, I watch a lot of that kind of content and I think it's fascinating. Uh, so let me know again if you want that down below. As someone who works in marketing and design, like me, I'm a graphic designer, I work in marketing, uh, I, I think the way that Virgie brands herself is really intentional as well to get the most profit from her business, which obviously when you have a business, the idea is to make profit, but my problem lies within what her business surrounds <laughs> or has to do with. Um, she comes off like super as a super sweet person. Her branding is super colorful and warm and welcoming. And it honestly reminds me a lot of like Sana Lee's branding on their website. But uh, and it all starts off like super cute, like I said, and welcoming. But the deeper you go and like, bam, it turns into creating like this us versus them mentality and paying a lot of men money for help from someone who really doesn't have the qualifications to give it to you. And particularly in the realm of diet and body image, uh, it is super dangerous. And so that's like 
my overarching thoughts and feelings on Virgie Tovar as a person. Um, I think when you look at her work through a more critical lens, it is like painfully obvious that she is very much capitalizing on fat acceptance and body positivity, um, more so than I think a lot of the like other big creators that I've talked about are, um, and I, or maybe on the same level, but just in a different way. That's more obvious. I don't know. Um, but yeah, that's all I, that's like what I wanted to talk about when it came to Virgie. Uh, let me know what you think of this whole thing down in the comments. Uh, thank you so much to Care Of for sponsoring this video. Go check out the link in my bio if you're interested in their products. I really like them. And yeah, that's all I really have to say. I've been talking for this video for, I've been talking to make this video for a very long time and my voice is getting tired and I'm hungry. So I'm gonna go eat some food. Anyway, remember to be kind to yourself, be kind to others, drink your water, take your meds, and I will see you in the next one. Okay, bye.